Welcome, all you happy warriors. I am your rabbi, Rabbi Daniel Lappin, thrilled to be welcoming happy warriors to this show where I reveal how the world really works. And I admire every happy warrior because not only are you somebody who recognizes that life is a challenge and is meant to be, but that we are meant to throw ourselves into those challenges, confronting them, facing them, and ultimately defeating them uh, with great joy in our hearts. And so to be part of this group is a, a real privilege for me, and I'm proud to do it. And I'm also happy because being a happy warrior is not that easy. And uh, the last thing I want is for you to be a lonely happy warrior, because um, the fact is that you are in a minority. The majority of people uh, can be completely distracted by means of what the Romans call circuses and bread. Um, that's a metaphor for entertainment and money. So let people think that they're making money, give them enough entertainment, like, you know, 30 different uh, television channels, and uh, they can be distracted. But happy warriors are not so easily distracted. Happy warriors, we're trying to improve our five Fs, our families, our finances, our faith, our friendships, and our physical fitness. And uh, that's a full-time job. We're, we're, we're busy with that. We are not easily distracted at all, but it's a minority of us. It can be lonely, and uh, that's why we have the website, wehappywarriors.com, right? Wehappywarriors.com, and uh, that puts you in connection with uh, thousands of other happy warriors all around the world, all trying to do exactly what you're doing, and all eager to to share secrets of how they've overcome particular roadblocks and eager to hear your ideas of what you have managed to accomplish. Now, today, one of the uh, techniques I want to give you, something that makes it easier to focus on your five Fs, is um, to have built into you a, an absolutely foolproof and reliable um, manure detector. Now, there are other words that can be used, but uh, being a family-friendly show, we will say a manure detector. Let me put it this way, you know, I didn't grow up on a farm, but I spent an awful lot of time on a farm as a child because my mom was a farming gal. Uh, she grew up on a farm, and uh, then she married my father and entered the wonderful world of rabbiing. But her father still farmed, and later on, uh, her brother farmed. And so we used to visit the farm uh, fairly often. I knew my way around, and, um, and uh, you know, I, I was very comfortable with farming culture. I still am very comfortable with the farming culture. And uh, we, to this day, by the way, I have to, this may sound a bit funny, but I, I have such, you know how memory is linked to the sense of smell? You know, you, you remember things when the smell comes back very strongly. And I have a nostalgic, strong recollection of horse manure and particularly cow manure. Because my uncle's farm, there were lots of horses, there were lots of cows. And uh, as I used to roam around with my cousins and uh, some of the workers' children on the farm, uh, we were constantly surrounded by horse manure and cow manure. And one of the lessons that uh, we understood was you had to kind of be able to recognize it. So you didn't want to stand in it. You didn't want to sit down and have a picnic in it. you got to be able to recognize horse manure and cow manure. And uh, I want to share with you today some of the secrets of spotting hoss manure and cow manure that is around you every day. There is so much information beamed at you. Every time you open a newspaper, you turn on the television, you uh, go online, a whole lot of stuff coming at you is pure, 
unadulterated horse manure and if it isn't horse manure it's cow manure only a small portion of it is actually real and true and so how do we go about spotting horse manure and cow manure after all sometimes the people that are uh, sending forth horse manure and cow manure uh, are uh, highly credentialed they are intellectuals and academics with fancy degrees and many letters after their names, and many of them occupy prestigious positions in privileged uh, universities and institutions and think tanks, and so surely they know what they're talking about, right? After all, wouldn't we want to trust science? Oh, sure, I trust science. It's scientists Human beings, you know, human beings who make their living inside, them are the ones that put out a whole lot of horse manure. I nearly said the wrong word. And a whole lot of cow manure. And so uh, we are providing a public service today. In a sense, you could think of me as the Mother Teresa of broadcasting because I am providing a service to you absolutely free of charge. This is a service that is going to equip you to be able to spot the cow manure and to spot the horse manure that comes at you every single day. Now, here is perhaps um, rule number one, perhaps a, a really important principle. Rule number one is that the overwhelming majority of horse manure and cow manure is referenced in the spiritual zone not the physical zone now i just want to clarify that you understand that when i say the the word spiritual uh, i am not speaking as a rabbi i'm speaking from the point of view of physics and mathematics from the point of view of science when i say spiritual please know i am not talking about theology or heaven or virtue or vice or uh, goodness i'm not speaking about that spiritual there's bad spiritual there's evil spiritual there's good spiritual no 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 that's not the when i say spiritual the definition is really simple are you ready here it is spiritual is anything that cannot be measured scientifically got it and so um, a person's weight can be measured scientifically, a person's gender can be measured scientifically, a person's skin color can be measured scientifically, but a person's integrity cannot. Now, I know that there are a number of companies, psychology evaluation companies, that promise employers that they can subject new recruits to a test that'll measure in integrity, but it unfortunately isn't true. If it was true, there would never be any employee embezzlement happening, and it happens all the time. So please be aware, no, integrity cannot be scientifically measured. Um, how about optimism cannot be measured scientifically? So a laboratory can tell me, a laboratory can tell me a whole lot of things about a person, but it cannot tell me about the things I really care about, because I don't really care about whether what their weight is or what their skin color is or how much hair they have on their head. I don't really care about those things. But what I do care about, how optimistic are they? How persistent are they? How much integrity do they have? Are they loyal to their friends? Those are the things I care about. And sadly, there is no scientific test because those are spiritual qualities. All right, that's the difference. So, uh, the weight of a book, physical. The uh, literary value of the content, no, there's no instrument for that. The weight of a saxophone or the length of a violin, all physical. How's about uh, whether the music made there is going to make me want to jump up and dance or whether it's going to make a lump in my throat of sadness? Music can do all of those things, but there's no scientific instrument in any laboratory in the world that can possibly give us that information. 
And so please understand then that when I say spiritual and physical, I'm talking about spiritual being things that cannot be measured in a, in a lab and physical is things that can. So the overwhelming majority of cow manure and horse manure is um, in the context always of spiritually related things. You know why? Because it's very hard to get away with speaking cow manure or horse manure on physical things. You know, somebody says um, um, the, uh, um, you know, the gravitational pull is, uh, is 9.8 meters per second squared on planet Earth, on the surface of planet Earth. And somebody else says, well, that depends in uh, neighborhoods occupied by people with black skin well it changes for them because they get badly done by so for them gravitational pull in black neighborhoods is only seven meters per second squared right every intelligent human being both black and white bursts out laughing at such stupidity because you won't hear it right no because we simply can measure gravity anywhere on the surface of the earth and we know it's the same pretty much everywhere I mean, the differences are teensy having to do with slight variations in the shape of the planet, not worth talking about now. But uh, a statement like that would never be made because people who are promoting horse manure and cow manure know to stay away from the physical world because it's much harder to pull the wool over our eyes. And so, um, you know, what's the distance from Cape Town to Cairo? It's easy, right? It's about 5,000 miles. What's the difference? What's the distance from a town <clears throat> in Vilnius, Lithuania called Vil, excuse me, a town, in Lith, uh, a town in Lithuania called Vilnius? What's the distance from Vilnius, shall we say, to Vladivostok on the eastern uh, border of Russia? Uh, that's about 4,500 miles. Right? Nobody's going to argue with that. Is anybody going to stand up and say, wait a second? You know, you're penalizing the African continent. This is part of systemic racism. You're making the distances too big. It's hard for people to get across the African continent. We need to change this. Let's make the distance from Cape Town to Cairo 3,000 miles. And we'll make the distance from Vilnius to Vladivostok, which is mostly white people. Let's make that six. That's nonsense, right? You know, people don't do that kind of thing because we'd burst out laughing at them simply because distances are physical phenomena. They're objectively measurable. It's not an argument, right? Oh, um, you, you asked me what the gravitational acceleration on the planet is. Well, it depends. For men, it's about 10.3 meters per second squared. For women, it's about uh, 7.2 meters per second squared. And that just goes to show the sexism that is a flagrant part of American thinking. <laughs> right? You don't hear that because it's rubbish. And so the nice thing about physical phenomena is that there's not a whole lot of um, uh, cow manure or horse manure. Now, you will hear things recently in American universities, which I think of as American kindergartens. Uh, you will hear things now that say that mathematics is inherently racist. Okay. The reason they say that is because they don't like the idea of any objective realities. And so if we can blow mathematics totally out of the game then it, we're free to change the distances as we like and we're free to change gravity we can do anything my point is that objective standards are loathed and detested by progressives and socialists and their lefty stormtroopers the area unfortunately where there is an extraordinary amount of um cow manure and horse manure going on and um, is in the area that touches on the spiritual i'll give you an example don't for one moment make the mistake of thinking so-called field of climate change is scientific scientific means it's measurable and it means everybody can measure that and end of co end of conversation end of argument end of debate 
right? Nobody's going to argue that the distance from Cape Town to Cairo is 11,000 miles because we all know what the answer is. We may argue which road you take, whether as the crow flies or direct, but if I say it's 5,000 miles, I'm pretty close and it's absolutely not 9,000 miles or 2,000 miles. Um, but um, in the area of things touching on the spiritual, it's different. Climate change, when they speak about that, it's simply not measurable. You know, there is considerable debate as to what happened a thousand years ago, or even 500 years ago, for that matter, a hundred years ago. And uh, the idea that we can actually measure that um, Florida waterfront real estate is going to be underwater in 50... <laughs> uh, do me a favor. I mean, come on. This just shows that the whole area of climate change has to do with spiritual. It's all part of the world of belief, not the world of facts. Physical phenomena, world of fact. Spiritual phenomena, world of belief. And the very fact that there is so much debate about climate change, and there's so much horse manure, and so much cow manure, proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that the whole field of, of climate science and climate change all belief, not fact. All spiritual, not physical. Okay, so you've got to be aware of that. Just because science is cited, that doesn't mean that it's actually scientific. It doesn't mean that it's physical. It doesn't mean that it's non-debatable. It doesn't mean that at all. And so um, you'll hear people say, well, um, it's so evil to travel by jet because we're impacting the climate, we're doing this, we're doing that, and there are foolish people who actually pay a surcharge when they buy an airplane ticket. Um, <clears throat> they make people like Al Gore giggle with glee because he makes money when foolish people buy carbon offsets in order to make it possible for them to fly with a clean conscience. Okay, Because... People do need belief systems, and when we take away their Judeo-Christian Bible-based belief systems, it doesn't mean that they then become objective and rational. It means that they then become susceptible to the most preposterous and outrageous superstitions. Have you heard that uh, we're soon going to have battery-powered planes, so we don't have to burn jet fuel when we travel around? Look, um, not going to happen in the foreseeable future. The most advanced battery technology at the moment is the lithium-ion battery. It's about 40 years old already, and it's even improved in the last 40 years, but it's pretty much at the limit of its improvement. The kind of improvement levels you're getting now are teensy-weensy, like fractions of a percent improvement, because it's kind of as good as it's going to get. And now there may be a totally new kind of battery technology out there. Um, I don't think so. I do believe that the good Lord is pushing us towards an acceptance of nuclear power. And uh, the fact that the uh, progressive socialist left, along with their lefty stormtroopers, the, re the fact that they uh, speak about, oh, we mustn't use fossil fuels, we need uh, renewables. So, you know, why not... Uh, a little bit of uranium. You think about it, you know, a pound of uranium is the equivalent of hundreds of thousands of tons of coal. So, you know, use uranium. This is, you know, they don't want to do it because the ultimate goal is to hurt the West, to hurt civilization, to hurt the United States of America and other countries. It's not to save the planet. Now, that's a pretty intense and provocative statement, but uh, I ask you to think about it. You know, one of the most important things of ensuring growth is to get oneself out of the habit of rejecting something that, you, that produces cognitive dissonance. You, you automatically, and most of us start off this way, our minds reject things that contradict positions we've already taken right? Um, people like thinking, I am who I am, I don't change, I've, I've got my clear worldview. Show me a person who says, I don't change my mind, and I'll show you uh, a, an intellectual cripple, right? Somebody who's literally incapable of growing. And so um, <clears throat> I say many things on these shows, which intuitively I know 
that you object to. I know that you say to yourself, ah, it's impossible. You know, he, he, what, like, he's the only person in the world who thinks that. We know what everyone, you know, mainstream thinking, etc., etc., etc. This is very controversial. You know, we know all that. But I also know that happy warriors are capable of hearing things. I, I don't ask you to take anything I say on face value. I don't ask you to have any faith in anything. I, please do not believe but admit it into your mental debate and your psychological food mixer. That's all I'm saying. Admit competing ideas, and then you take your time to weigh them up and evaluate them. That's all I'm saying. So uh, um, am I the only person in the world who says that we're not going to see a battery-powered passenger liner crossing the Atlantic? No, no. But you have to dig for it because it's an unpopular position. The popular position today that is rewarded in academia and government, oh, we're going to move on to electrical power very soon. Yeah, I don't think so. Why don't I think so? Because I deal in physical facts. I deal in physics and mathematics when I'm dealing with the physical world. And whether a battery-powered airplane can work is a physical question. It's not a belief question or a spiritual question. And I know that we know exactly how many watt-hours per kilogram of energy you get from jet fuel. And I know exactly how many watt-hours per kilogram you get from the best battery in the whole world. And um, the amount of energy in jet fuel is more than 50 times the amount of energy in the same weight of battery. It has another disadvantage, and that is that as a jet airliner reaches moves towards its destination, it's getting lighter and lighter and lighter. And so uh, the, the way the aircraft is built, uh, it's not able to take a fully loaded landing. That's why if a plane takes off, and something goes wrong and they need to land, they dump the fuel. Why don't they just land? Because the landing gear is not built to take the force of a full airplane landing. So you have to dump the fuel first. also reduces the risk of fire. But a battery doesn't change its weight. As you use up the energy stored within it, the weight stays exactly the same. That's another disadvantage. Anyway, bottom line is that right now uh, we do not have the physical ability to transport people, many people, a long distance by battery airplanes. Um, I think it's not out of the question that we will see small planes, you know, 12-passenger airplanes capable of doing 100 miles or 150 miles, sort of short haul. I think that's possible. Whether it's economical or not, I have no idea. That's information, again, not hard to get, but I never did it. So uh, physical is where we do not see a whole lot of horse manure or cow manure. Spiritual is where we do. And uh, what I want to do now is, as the Mother Teresa of Broadcasting, I want to give you some examples. I want to give you some exercises. So I'm going to give you a sequence of statements now that are made uh, by very by prominent people, academics, intellectuals, journalists, scientists, all kinds of people, and that have appeared in extremely influential newspapers. You know, I'm talking about the Brookings Institute. I'm speaking about Harvard Political Review. I'm speaking about the New York Times. Uh, These are all uh, significant places. And these words I'm giving you have come directly from these journals, these magazines, these newspapers, these publications. I have not taken anything out of context. I have not modified anything. And your job is to try and spot the flaw, to spot the cow manure, spot the horse manure. I know you can do it. So uh, September the 2nd, 2020, the New York Times magazine uh, ran a big article entitled How Hunger Persists in a Rich Country Like America. Um, As is standard for the New York Times, it was an attack on the United States, obviously. But that's, you know, I'm not interested in the, for the moment, I'm not interested in the political biases of the New York Times. I think everyone knows about those. But what I am interested in is, where is the flaw here? 
how hunger persists in a rich country like America. Well, can I say there are no hungry people in America? No. Uh, as, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, I, I can tell you that um, on one day in um, September 2020, I was really hungry. You know what it was? It was Yom Kippur, the Jewish festival called the Day of Atonement, where we do not eat or drink for about 25 hours. I don't remember which date it was in September, but probably fairly close to the time that article appeared. I was pretty hungry. So how hunger persists in a rich country like America. um, Look, in general, I mean, can I say there's no hungry people? Of course not. Um, Is it also possible to say with exactly the same seriousness, um, how can obesity exist in a country like America? That would also be a true statement, right? But the problem here isn't the hunger or the obesity. The article was entitled, How Hunger Persists in a Rich Country Like America. Okay, what am I talking about? Uh, My friends, countries are not rich or poor. People are. Now, if you have a country in which a significant proportion of the population is rich, then that is one kind of country. But you can't call it a rich country. Rich means that the rich person has significant assets and significant purchasing power. That's what a rich person is. But a rich country, it doesn't make sense because the only way a country gets money is by confiscating it from its citizens through one or another or any one of 15 or 20 or 100 taxation schemes. And so, you know, uh, if a country confiscated all the wealth of its citizens, it would have a lot of money for a short period of time. But inevitably, corruption would very quickly dissipate that, and uh, all that will have happened is that wealth will have been redistributed from the people who made it to the people who took it. So, Uh, The flaw in that is the term rich country like America. No, there is no such thing as rich or poor countries. There is rich or poor people. Well, actually, not even that is true. You know why? Because the word rich is undefined. And so uh, if one person um, has very little income but spends his time doing exactly what he likes doing, Um, He relaxes, he goes hiking, he goes swimming, but, um, you know, just he lives on very little. Maybe maybe he's a homeless person. Maybe he lives in a tent at the beach or in the city park. And then you've got somebody else who works very hard, has very little time for leisure, gives away a lot of money. And um, and now we're we're set with the problem of which one is rich and which one is poor. Or uh, how about... Um, One person decides that uh, he chooses that his wife will stay home and raise their children and build the family and create a a real home. And somebody else says, me and my wife are both working 24-7 and we're building up our bank account. These are two different human choices. And so now to try and, uh, and assign values to these two that make one rich and one poor and very impossible to do. I was going to say very difficult, but it's actually impossible to do. Um, Also, it's a a case of uh, the kind of choices that people make. And so rich and poor, those things could be used for animals. We don't we don't do it. But you could say that, you know, uh, an elephant that gets enough food is a rich elephant because that's it. That's his requirements. But for us, there's so much else. And we're willing to exchange money for some of the other things. Right. That's, you know, it's money by itself uh, is an unhealthy fixation. But as a means to things that are really important to one, then money becomes very important. But um the term rich and the term country are the flaws in that New York Times article from September 2nd, 2020. Um, Back in 2010, in November 2010, there's a magazine called the Harvard Political Review. 
I don't have to tell you how prominent and prestigious that uh, magazine is. And um, here is the article's title. America is the richest country in the world. Same mistake. But then he goes on to say, I'm going to tell you the three reasons why. And one of the reasons America is the richest country in the world, according to him, is massive immigration. That's one of his three reasons. Really? That's what creates American wealth? So, uh, so really, California should be doing very well because it's got a huge immigrant population, right? No, I don't think so. It doesn't quite work that way. Uh, his second one is common law. Um, the, the rule of law is a more correct way of stating that, and there's a reason why he used the common law. And then his third one, which I disagree with as well, the great scientific exodus during World War II. Many Jewish scientists escaping Nazism, immigrated to the United States. All right, fine. You know what? Uh, that's 80 years ago already. And um, so, yeah, I don't think so. Anyway, my main objection to this article from November 2010 in the Harvard Political Review, America is the richest country in the world. What does that mean even? Is, what does it mean? Well, it gets even better. Listen to this one. This is from February 2021. This is a very recent one. So from February 21, 2021, uh, the Brookings Institute, very influential uh, organization in Washington, D.C., puts out a magazine regularly. The issue of February 2021 has a story entitled, <clears throat> I mean, you've got to listen to this, Rich Countries Have a Moral Obligation to Help Poor Countries. Get it? Rich countries have a moral obligation to help poor countries. That's the article. Um, what's wrong with that? Can you spot the horse manure? Can you spot the cow manure? Well, again, rich countries. Okay, same problem. Same problem. Rich country. What's a rich country? What's a poor country? Right? You, at different times, you'll hear people saying Sweden is a much richer country than America. Uh, they've got a better system. And, uh, you know, is a, uh, is a greater proportion of people in Switzerland uh, wealthier than, the same, than, the, than in America? Sure. So maybe Switzerland is a rich country. You've you, you got to be very careful. So that's one piece of horse manure and cow manure in this article is rich countries. We've spoken about that already. But here's a good one. Have a moral obligation to help poor countries. Okay. Here's the uh, reason why that statement, moral obligation to help poor countries, is pure horse manure and cow manure. First of all, the term morality applies only to people. I cannot emphasize this adequately. There is no such thing as morality with animals. If a wolf gobbles up a farmer's sheep, that's not an immoral wolf. Okay? It's a wolf doing what wolves do. And by the way, I've covered this really beautifully and extensively in Scrolling Through Scripture. You'll see that on my website, Scrolling Through Scripture. Um, covered that very, very heavily. Uh, you want to tell the farmer to build a stronger fence to keep the wolf away from his sheep? Fine. You want to tell him to put a sheepdog out there to protect his flock? Do that. But you don't hold a symposium to discuss the declining morality in the local wolf population. It's rubbish, right? Um, uh, money is immoral. I've heard people say that. Money is immoral. No. Right? People can put money to immoral use. Right? If you pay somebody to murder somebody, that's an immoral use of money. But money itself cannot be moral or immoral. A gun is not moral or immoral. And a country certainly is no, it doesn't have a moral or immoral. There isn't such a thing. Secondly, if you speak about moral obligation, it is pure horse manure and cow manure not to state the framework. Right? In other words... Uh, Muslim terrorists who cut the throat of American stewardesses on the 9th of on the 11th of September 2001, um, they did so 
in the spirit of a moral obligation. And so importantly did they regard that moral obligation, they were even even willing to sacrifice their own lives to do that moral obligation. So, you know, a moral obligation is a meaningless word if you don't say according to to Islam, according to Christianity, according to Judaism, according to the Bible, according to the law of this or the law of that. Okay, it, it all depends. And so just to throw out the word moral or immoral is complete horse manure and complete cow manure if you don't specify in accordance to what framework of morality that is. That's, that's what we're talking about. And so Uh, That would be yet another example of horse manure and cow manure. We've got to be able to understand that. Um, A moral obligation, right. How How about a person? Does a person have a moral obligation to help the poor? It depends. It depends. Um, To what extent is that individual so-called poor person complicit in his own misfortune? If he is living badly and his values are self-destructive so as that he's complicit in his own poverty, then there is no moral obligation to help him. So this idea that rich countries have a moral obligation to help poor, first of all, throw out the rich countries. Secondly, throw out moral obligation if you're not willing to state the framework in according to what moral system. Right? There's no universal system of morality. There should be, but there isn't. And uh, the use of the word poor, it's not so simple. Um, Not so simple to just say poor. Somebody who uh, lives very self-destructively and therefore does not earn any money and lives on the charity and the generosity of his fellow citizens who pay extraordinarily high rates of taxation so so that the government can give him the money, is that a poor person whom I have an obligation to support? No. I support him because I have no choice in paying taxes, but it's not by it's not a moral obligation to do so. Um, how's about October the 10th, 2018? This is a few years back. October the 10th, 2018, um, the Institute for Policy Studies, a hugely influential organization and magazine that, um, I mean, virtually every major figure in any American administration reads the Institute for Policy Studies. Many of them write for it and submit articles. And um, here is the title and subtitle of an article written by Josh Hoxie in October the 10th, 2018. Are you ready for this one? Please, by now, your, your fail-safe, reliable cow manure detector and horse manure detector should be up and running and working pretty well. I'm going to uh, read it to you, and you try and think, what is the problem here? Okay, here it comes. No one, this is how the, uh, the, the title reads. No one in the United States should be poor, period. Subtitle, Amazon's wage hike is welcome news, but nobody's well-being should depend on the whims of a billionaire CEO. I read it one more time because your job is to spot the horse manure and the cow manure. And there's lots of it here. You ready? No one in the United States should be poor, period. Amazon's wage hike is welcome news. But nobody's well-being should, be, should depend on the whims of billionaire CEOs. <laughs> All right. Got it? Figured it out? You probably have. While you're figuring it out, though, uh, you're probably wondering, so how do you develop a clearer sense of spiritual and physical? How do you get a stronger ability and a, a good workout in being able to distinguish between the two and being able effectively to identify instances of where this is being exploited to baffle you and bewilder you and to mislead you and confuse you. And um, what I would recommend is something that Susan Lappin and I prepared a little while ago called the Genesis Journeys Set. 
And the nice thing about this is you can download it immediately after this show. You can just go to the website and download it. Uh, or if you prefer, you can have it sent to you in um, in audio CDs along with study guides. You download it, you'll get the study guide as a PDF. And so uh, what is it called? The Genesis Journey Set. It's made up of uh, four separate programs, each one tackling a different aspect of the physical spiritual understanding. Uh, each one is about two hours long. Each one has a full color study guide. Here is the title of each of the, the titles of each of the four, all of the four. Uh, first one is on male female relationships. Madam, I'm Adam, decoding marriage secrets from Eden. Eden. Uh, the second one is Clash of Destiny, right? decoding the secrets of Israel and Islam. The third one is Tower of Power, decoding the secrets of Babel. And number four, The Gathering Storm, decoding the secrets of Noah. And so if you would enjoy sitting down with your spouse, maybe with your intended spouse, maybe with your children, if you'd enjoy sitting down, And spending an hour at a time or two hours at a time or eight hours at a time going through exactly where and how these biblical insights are found and understanding the real world implications of these insights, then you would want to get yourself a copy of the Genesis Journeys set. And to do that, you go to my website, rabbidaniellappin.com and go to the store, and then you'll find the Genesis Journeys set, right? It's a four-part set, Madam, I'm Adam, Marriage, Clash of Destiny, um, the eternal struggle between Israel and Islam, a a Tower of Power, the ultimate seductive power of socialism, very relevant to how uh, many people around the world today are being seduced by socialism, And then finally, The Gathering Storm, uh, which is societal collapse in terms of uh, sexual mores, abortion, and uh, many other things. Um, These are all part of what's called the Genesis Journeys set. And you can either have us mail you uh, the audio CDs, or you can download it right away. So go to rabbidaniellappin.com and uh, go to the store and search for the Genesis Journeys set, and you'll get a choice of having it mailed to you or getting the download, and uh, you will really enjoy. By the way, I mean, it it really brings about closeness, and uh, if you want to make sure that you and members of your family are on the same same team, same page, same music, if you want to make sure that you're all moving along in the same general direction in terms of spiritual values, then here you have an eight-hour training program. Really, I mean it. All you've got to do is set aside time to listen together and then talk about it. And so uh, we've got lots and lots of people who've written beautiful letters to me of how they play sometimes only about a half an hour at dinner And then for the rest of dinner, the family discusses it. And they say, people have said to me, you know, I can't keep my kids at the dinner table. You know, they gobble their food and then they want to go off to play video games or something. This is the first time we've actually managed to get them to be there. Well, because you are listening to what they have to say. You've posed a set of provocative um, questions. Stip- uh, not, not stipulations, but you've presented uh, some provocative propositions, or at least I have, and you've played it for them, and uh, and now you're willing to talk about it. Believe me, when a family spends time discussing values and debating spiritual values, you're bringing the family closer together. And so um, really, you know, the, the value of this is what it does for your family and uh, what it does for human beings. You, you might decide to put a small group together at, at church or synagogue and listen to it. However you decide to use it, the point is that when people develop a shared outlook on ultimate spiritual values, they become closer together. 
Right. So there it is. Genesis Journeys set. And um, you can get that at rabbidaniellappin.com. Please do go ahead. Okay. So what is the cow manure and the horse manure on the question of uh, no one in the United States should be poor, period, says the Institute for Policy Studies in October 2018. Uh, And then they say Amazon's wage hike is welcome, but nobody's well-being should depend on the whims of billionaire CEOs. Okay. Uh, What's wrong with this one? No one in the United States should be poor, period. According to whom? When you say should be, that's a moral judgment. According to who? What are you talking about? And if there are, who's at fault? Well, I could guess the United States probably. But um, again, we've got the issue of poor. What does poor really mean? Right. Does poor mean having an income of below 30000 a year, 20000 a year? Is that what poor means? How about the uh, retired person who has vast assets and a very, a very low income? Right. Is he poor? Believe me, the term poor is non-real when applied to human beings. It simply is non-applicable. So no one in the United States should be poor. Why? Why is that? So I'll tell you what's going on here. Um, When the Bible speaks of poor, I'm thinking of Deuteronomy chapter 15, for instance, Bible speaks of of poor. um, What are they talking about? Well, the Hebrew word is not an absolute. It doesn't say, well, they're this amount, right? When it speaks about poor, there are two categories. One is somebody who has no idea what he's going to eat tonight and where he's going to sleep tonight. That's one level of poor. Another level of poor is somebody who has less than you. So, again, it's important to understand every human being in every normal society, even this was even true in the Soviet Union, it's true in Cuba, it's true in China, every single human being can turn around and look over one shoulder and find somebody who has much less than they. But they can also turn around and look over the other shoulder and see someone who has much more. And so, with respect to the person who has much more, he looks at you as, oh, you poor person. With respect to the person who has much less, he looks at you and says, oh, what a rich person. Rich and poor are purely relative terms. They are not absolute. Now, that the person who writes articles for the Institute for Policy Studies needs to be told this is extraordinary. And it tells me that they are moving into the area of belief and indoctrination in this case. So it's it's pretty amazing. Um, the idea that we are also uh, passive beings with no agency in our own circumstance no one in the United States should be poor. And if they are, well, it's the fault of the United States. Presumably, that's what he's saying. By the way, when you read the article, it's not as if clarity ensues. I can tell you that. Um, and uh, nobody's well-being should depend on the whims of billionaire CEOs. Again, this is all based on the idea that the minimum wage is the correct avenue out of poverty, whatever poverty means. All right, obviously I'm not going to the minimum wage today, but um, but there there it is. Um, you know, actually, you know what? Let's, let's jump to Foreign Policy Magazine. Again, everyone in the State Department in the United States reads it. It's read in London and Whitehall. It's read in many countries around the world. Uh, Foreign Policy Magazine. Right? It's uh, for government people. And the article says... What's a rich country? It might seem an innocuously straightforward question, but it's not. Rich enough to do what? If you define rich as being able to afford long-range missiles and nuclear weapons, then even poverty-plagued North Korea qualifies as uh, what about being rich enough to ensure a decent life for all your country's citizens? Remember, there is no such thing as a rich country. The cow manure and the horse manure occurred in the very first line of the article. What's a rich country? It's nonsensical. And then the rest of the article is trying to define what a rich country is, but they can't do it. Maybe a rich country is enough to ensure a decent life for all your country's citizens. It's not possible. 
There is no way for government. The founders were smart enough to realize that it's not the job of government to ensure a decent life for all your country's citizens. What is a decent life? What happens if somebody has a dissolute and depraved lifestyle? Is there any government on earth that could ensure him a decent life? This is sheer nonsense. But remember, the nonsense always comes about in the non-measurable areas of belief, never in the areas of physically measurable phenomena. So, uh, oh, here's another, uh, here's how that paragraph ends in terms of what's a rich country. Maybe it means being rich enough to be a good global citizen, providing aid to those in more desperate need. So you hear, you see from here, there is an implicit obligation on, shall we say, Great Britain, Sweden, Switzerland, and the United States to give money to Bangladesh, Somalia, the Sudan, and Zimbabwe. Right? That's what it's saying. Because, right, a good global citizen. Again, using the terms good global citizen means you're using a principle of morality where it doesn't exist. There is no, you've, you've given no measure of morality anywhere. You've not told me what it is or where it is. It's simply not there. And, uh, and, and so there again, it's like nonstop. What I, what I recommend you do, because you're going to not only enjoy this, but it's actually going to benefit you, start turning on your highly sensitive cow manure and horse manure detectors before you read or watch or listen to any piece of information and you'll be astounded really astounded i hope i've made it clear that um, money is a spiritual phenomenon and so there's a great deal of uh, cow manure and horse manure in the area of business finance economics anything to do with money um, for instance, I hear very often people saying, I'm very underpaid. And I usually try and make a joke about it. You know, and I, I, I smile and I say, yeah, who doesn't think they're underpaid? And then the person says, no, I really am. You know, I'm, I'm a teacher or I'm a this or I'm a that. I'm really underpaid. So I say, well, are you telling me because you'd like some advice? And they say, well, like, do you have any and I said, do I ever? Am I a rabbi for nothing? Sure. Quit. Excuse me? I said, quit. Why, why would you be willing to work somewhere where you're underpaid? Quit. Tomorrow. Today. Quit. And they look at me bewildered and they say, well, um, you know, well, so, you know, how am I going to make a living? I say, well, you start working for somebody who pays you the right amount. And they say, uh, well, how do I not find such a job? To which I say, aha! Yes, exactly. You see, there is no such thing as underpaid. If you are willing to work for that, you are not underpaid. You are being paid. What you and your employer have mutually agreed upon is your value. And if you made a mistake, quit and go and work somewhere where you get paid the amount you think you're worth. That's a really important point to understand. Value is something that is the figure at which two human beings agree to affect a transaction, right? That's all it is. There is no such thing as objective value because on spiritual matters, there is a, 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 a possibility of differing views, because different people have different value systems. Um, what is the, you know, in the absence of other human beings, nothing you have is any value. The only value is in the presence of other human beings. What's the value of your house? I've got a better question. What is the value of a beautiful, large mansion in Palm Beach, Florida, if the owner is the last human on earth? There are no other people on earth. Everybody else has vanished. Last year, what's the value of his house? Probably zero, because <laughs> there's nobody be willing to buy it. Do you understand what I'm saying? 
And so, um, <clears throat> uh, well, I, you know, I'd, I'd value my um, uh, 1911 edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica at, uh, oh, $2,000. What does that mean? It means that I might be willing to sell it for 2000 However, unless there's somebody willing to buy it for that money, the valuation is meaningless. It's simply a figure I put on it. But that doesn't tell me what it's actually worth. Do you follow? This is like really important to understand. So here is the last and perhaps very best example of cow manure and horse manure. This one is from a Philadelphia newspaper. <clears throat> You'll pardon me. And this was published April, Philadelphia Inquirer, actually, as it happens. And this was published at uh, the end of April 2021. And here's the headline. Homes in black neighborhoods are valued less than similar homes in white areas. Okay, think about that for a moment. What's wrong with that? Where's the cow manure and horse manure in that statement, right? Well, here's the subheading. In Philadelphia, homes in primarily black neighborhoods are undervalued by an average of about $26,000 or 27% compared with similar homes in primarily white neighborhoods. So on the surface of it, it sounds like maybe appraisers are racist <clears throat> and when they recognize a house is in a black neighborhood, they just downgrade the valuation just because they don't like black people. That's what it sounds like. That's what you meant to understand with the re when reading this. But you are a happy warrior, and you know what the three most important rules in real estate are, right? That's right. Location, location, and location. Right? And so what, uh, what this woman is doing, Michelle Bond, she says, well, here's a four-bedroom house with a lawn on so much with three bathrooms, and it's in a white neighborhood, and here's a similar home with exactly the same number of bedrooms and bathrooms, and it's in a black neighborhood, and it's worth 27% less. Must be that appraisers are racist. So she advises that if you're a human being with black skin, and you are having a bank appraiser come to your house to work out uh, whether you can get a, a second mortgage or whatever, take away all the photographs so that, honestly, I know, you're probably cracking up already. You're probably saying to yourself, stop, stop, I'm already drowning in cow manure and horse manure. And you'd be right. She says, yeah, take away all so photographs and family pictures so the appraiser won't know you're black, and that way your the valuation of her house will be higher. Really? I mean, nobody understands neighborhoods. right? Now, you want to talk about why the neighborhood is that way? It has a lot to do with a lot of things, including value systems, right, in, in, in every meaning of the word. Um, in other words, to say that uh, there's high crime in black neighborhoods, which this article also speaks about, to say there's high crime in black neighborhoods, um, and that's because of systemic racism, which causes poverty, um, that is to suggest that poor people break the law. And the truth is that breaking the law produces poverty. It's just back to front. Now, this is very much against popular thinking, mainstream media, but you need to think about it for yourself. Homes in black neighborhoods are valued less than similar homes in white areas. Oh, no, shriek, shriek, racism's at work. And then she goes on to explain, in Philadelphia, homes in primarily black neighborhoods are undervalued by an average of $26,000 or 27% compared with similar homes in white neighborhoods. Hello? Location? 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 Crime? Values? There is a reason. And you've got to think about it. If you want to ascribe this all to systemic racism... Please try. Go ahead, try and figure out a construct that would allow you to do that. 
you're going to find it to be incredibly difficult. I really, really did try with every good faith in the world. I tried to buy into her idea that it's uh, it's racism in the mind of bank v- appraisers um, because as soon as they know that a house is in occupied by black people, they give it a lower appraisal. Right? It's it doesn't make sense. Yeah, it doesn't pass the cow manure horse manure test, and yet a mainstream newspaper here it is, and um, and the article continues all the way proceeding to to make this case that uh, appraisers are racist and that's what's going on here well it's 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 pretty tough my friends but um, all of this is what we find in everything that comes in at us and I want to wrap us up now with just a moment or two of reasons for what's going on in other words why is it that there is so much horse manure and cow manure in the belief spiritual side of life in the world today in almost any country you live in why there's so little uh, cow manure and horse manure on the physical side is because those things are measured that's one of the reasons that in the universities or kindergartens of the united states of america for the most part the science and technology and engineering and mathematics departments at those universities are somewhat freer of uh, political leftism and political correctness because for the most part you're dealing with measurable physical phenomena it's mostly the liberal arts areas all right gender studies all right and so on and so forth that's pretty much where it is why and i'll tell you the reason i said it once earlier in the show i want to emphasize it and repeat it and that is that every human being needs something to believe in Now, this is on a very deep subconscious level, right? I'm not saying you walk around scratching your head every day saying, now, what can I believe in? I'm not saying that. But I'm saying on a deep and often subconscious level, we human beings need to believe that our lives are more than simply being a few dollars worth of common chemicals laid out in the form of cells, and we get born we eat, we defecate, we reproduce, and we die. It's difficult to live with believing that is the full essence of my life. And people who do believe that very often feel themselves going downhill. It becomes a self-destructive system. And so most people, even subconsciously, yearn to create for themselves systems of belief They seek out something that makes sense of the world. Now, the one that works best that I can tell you about is called the Judeo-Christian Bible-based belief system. And um, it it, it starts off with everything. It, It gives you relationships between males and females. It gives you our relationship with the world of nature covered in the first two chapters of Genesis. Um, It goes on to speak about family relationships. It speaks an enormous amount about finance, economics, money, and business, a tremendous amount of that. It speaks about rule of law and property. And so it is an entire belief system that makes sense of our lives. And we all need something like that. Now, if for one reason or another you've decided to reject. Maybe you had a bad experience at church. Maybe your parents were very religious and they uh, inflicted a religious rigidity on you. Uh, Maybe you had a bad teacher at Sunday school or a bad rabbi or whatever it was, but there's something, or maybe, maybe you got influenced by several years at a university where you were indoctrinated to believe that secular atheism is a higher level. It reveals more intellectual ability and it reveals a greater intelligence you all of these things you could easily have been influenced at different stages of your life but whatever it is you know here you are right now um you need faith now you can choose faith 
in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You can choose faith based on the Judeo-Christian, biblically-based system. You can do that, which I think is a pretty good choice. I think it gets you to the right place, and it has the additional advantage of being true, but that's just my belief. Or, on the other hand, you can choose the alternative. And it turns out that there's not really that many alternatives. The alternative right now, available to all in all parts of the world, is secular socialism, progressivism, and, um, and leftism. And here's why it's wrong to compare capitalism and socialism. Capitalism is nothing but an economic system. Capitalism is a system that uh, addresses the questions of how money is created, how property is uh, distributed, how ownership is calculated. That's all capitalism is. It's pure numbers. But here's the advantage of socialism. You see, socialism is an entire belief system. And socialism uses the language of morality, taking care of the poor. One of the latest ones is the children. Do you know that there's an epidemic of poor children in America? Who doesn't feel compassion rise in their hearts of all these poor children? Hey, poor children, what, roaming the streets, living in bus shelters? Or are they children of maybe single mothers who've made bad decisions? It happens, you know. And I I have to tell you the truth here. It doesn't mean I'm lacking in compassion. I I feel a need to defend myself. but, But it's more important for me to tell you the reality. And the reality sometimes is painful. Heaven knows I've been confronted by truth on more than one occasion in my life. And uh, the pain has been um, uh, almost unbearable, right? Truth can sometimes, when it forces you into a realization about your outlook or your, or your life or your decisions, I mean, what's more painful than regret? And I, I get a lot of emails, right? People go to my website to send me emails. Uh, people, people write about mistakes. I mean, I've heard this very often. Where were you when I was 20? And I get it. I get it. It's not me. I mean, it's the principles of ancient Jewish wisdom. And yes, they they enable one to make the right decisions in life. That is exactly why we have the WeHappyWarriors.com group. That's exactly why I've created the Scrolling Through Scriptures um, program. That's exactly why on my website you can find the Financial Prosperity Collection. Because when you know how the world really works, you're better equipped to make the right decisions. And believe me, you you don't have to believe me, you know yourself. Life works better when you make right decisions instead of wrong decisions. And heaven knows there's a lot of wrong decisions you can make in life. A whole lot of them. Much better to make the right decisions. And so, yes... What kind of belief system you choose is very relevant. And so if you decide to choose the belief system that is materialistically based and that uh, has no God, but it's nonetheless a belief system because it's based on socialism and socialism is a vast uh, landscape. It's a vast matrix of truths and principles and values, right? I can tell you what the values of socialism are. Equality, which makes inequality one of the huge vices, one of the huge sins. Uh, Another one is internationalism, globalism. That's also part of socialism. The idea that all human beings are the same and that it's wrong to classify ourselves into nations, into uh, states, into counties, into cities, into families. All of these things are wrong because we love all human. These are some of the values of socialism. There's no comparable values in capitalism. Capitalism is not the opposite of socialism. You know, that's like saying a Toyota is the opposite of a pineapple. It's rubbish. It's two completely different things. Socialism and capitalism, they're not opposites of each other at all. And so, You've got to choose, you know, what your belief system is. Uh, I believe in being a good person. Okay, you know the fault with that already. Your cow manure detector, your horse manure detector is jangling like crazy. Right? Because when you say good, you have to say according to what moral system. Right? Good is not self-evident. 
It's not at all self-evident. You've got to say it's good according to socialism or it's good according to Judeo-Christian Bible-based value systems. That, my friends, is how it works. And that is how the world really does work. And so uh, I do hope that this uh, little program has given you a chance to uh, fire up your cow manure and horse manure detectors and that you're fine-tuning them and you are really going to enjoy deploying them now, right? Turn them on. Turn them on when you read the news. Turn them on when you listen to uh, uh, anything. You read a book, listen to an audio book, listen to a, a podcast, listen to a radio show. You should have your, your, uh, your uh, uh, cow manure and horse manure detectors firing when you listen to everything, including my show, by all means. You know, I, I really don't want you to take anything on faith, as I said evaluate it according to your own life experiences the things you have understood to be true and in that context you will know whether in fact this is cow manure and horse manure or whether in fact no it is a guide to identifying what really is horse manure and what really is cow manure and that my friends is how the world really works the website is www.rabbidaniellappin.com do visit with us, and uh, you can drop me a line over there. I'd love to hear from you. You can also read back copies of all our columns and articles. There's a whole lot of ancient Jewish wisdom for free right there on the website. And uh, you should also take a look at the Genesis Journeys set, which I've spoken to you about. You might also want to look at the Financial Prosperity Collection and uh, that way you help me to help you and we all move forward developing our five F's, becoming more effective, holistic human beings. So uh, until next week, my happy warriors, I want to wish you very good times in your relationships with your faith, with your finances, with your family, with your friendships and your physical fitness. I'm Rabbi Daniel Lappin. God bless.